Hi, I'm Dharmesh Thacker, a general partner at Battery Ventures, here to present our annual State of the Open Cloud Report, which covers the macro technology and economic trends impacting the cloud market, and advice for cloud native entrepreneurs who are navigating these trends to build large and enduring businesses. While the economic news continues to be painful for the industry most days, we are still long cloud infrastructure and open source software. Here are just a few reasons why. I will cover them in more detail. First, we are painfully aware of the compression in software revenue multiples. Across the board, multiples have compressed over 50% with the highest growth names facing the most compression by almost 75% from 40x forward revenue to 10x forward revenue multiple. Most of the pain is interest rate related. The tides have really turned very quickly here. Last year, with interest rates at nearly zero, you could borrow money and invest for high growth, targeting profitability four to five years out once you achieved scale. Now that interest rates are 300 plus basis points higher, the cost of borrowing and burning cash over several years has really started to hurt companies. Investors are unwilling to carry that burn profile for four to five years, punishing stocks which have come down considerably. What is interesting though, is that many of these companies have still maintained a healthy 20% plus growth rate at scale and are moving to profitability even sooner. But nonetheless, most of these public stocks are getting punished across the board. As many companies evaluate their cost structure and profitability, they're making headcount cuts and paring back from the strong headcount growth they had last year. 70,000 cuts were made in the last two quarters alone across 400 software and cloud companies. Now the pain isn't just across public companies, they just happen to have their stock marked to market every day and they're in the news. But late stage private companies have a rocky path ahead as well. Compared to the thousand unicorns that were created in the last few years, only 200 had the financial profile to eventually go public. There are over 400 software unicorns with a 3 billion average valuation. To generate a 3x return for investors and a $10 billion exit, they likely need a billion dollar revenue run rate, which only 70 public companies have achieved to date. You then look forward at the 65 private companies with five and $10 billion valuations, and you'll see that you need to scale their revenue by 10 or 20x to the tune of two to $5 billion all before their cash runs out to have a positive outcome in an IPO. As mentioned earlier, the market has moved from fast growth at all costs to measured growth and efficiency. In November 2021, during the market peak, software companies with 30% growth had a substantially higher growth adjusted multiple than efficient growth companies shown as the rule of 40 column, which is growth plus profitability being more than 40%. Today, the tables have turned where efficient growth is being rewarded with a 40% higher multiple at 0.4x versus purely high growth companies. Now, when you start looking at which of these companies have started to make this transition to efficient growth successfully, it is mostly companies with a cloud business component who are growing faster than on-premises legacy businesses. For instance, at MongoDB, Elastic, and Confluent, Cloud native software businesses are growing much faster than their on-premise counterparts. This in turn is allowing them to drive higher efficiency in growth as they can acquire and grow customers much more efficiently on their cloud platforms than with traditional on-premise offerings. Now turning to the good news. Frankly, founders can control these, which is revenue and margins. Despite all the macro concerns and pain with multiple compression, we are now seeing more software companies at scale than we have ever seen before. For instance, 20 companies from the IPO cohort of the last three years have more than a billion dollars in next 12 month revenue compared to just seven a decade ago. Secondly, even in this market, cloud native companies that demonstrate growth and efficiency make up eight of the 10 most highly valued software companies, presenting some interesting best practices 
that others and try and adopt. We'll talk about that more in the next section. Talking about billion dollar revenue streams, cloud giants, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, continue to grow at a massive scale, ending at almost $160 billion in Q2 at a 40% growth rate. That's adding over $50 billion over the next four quarters, despite all the pain in the market. Not only are they growing at massive scale, they are tremendously profitable at scale as well. AWS, and that is Amazon Web Services, for instance, has a 30% operating margin or about $25 billion in profits, making up half of Amazon's overall profit and over half their $1.2 trillion market cap. Azure is at a 40% margin or about $25 billion and makes up a quarter of Microsoft's $2 trillion market cap. Google Cloud is earlier in the cycle, but getting there. So clearly you can see that you can grow at a massive scale and drive efficiency gains as you scale. Just as you digest these staggering numbers, it is even more impressive to note that we are only 20% penetrated with cloud software relative to legacy software. In 2022, we're expecting $222 billion across the cloud giants and all cloud native companies combined. But there's another $700 billion of legacy infrastructure services and hardware that can be disrupted. Another way to see it is that cloud infrastructure software can grow from 200 billion to 400 billion in the next three years and still have another 800 billion in headroom to grow displacing legacy software and services. Now you may ask, what about all the inflation and labor shortage talk that dominates public media these days? Isn't that compressing spend across all categories, including cloud infrastructure? Maybe in the next couple quarters, as we saw Microsoft Azure give guidance for compression to 37% versus 42% last week with earnings, but that's at a $55 billion scale. In general, cloud infrastructure seems fairly resilient. And interestingly, history shows us that whenever we have had labor shortage and job cuts during high inflation periods in the past, software companies have provided a deflationary counterbalance driving more productivity with less labor and have grown revenue substantially in the years that have followed high inflation. Now, let's turn our attention to operational best practices that we have seen other founders and CEOs across our portfolio and many companies we think about highly. What have they adopted to set themselves up as a top decile company with an efficient growth path and revenues at scale? The first thing to recognize is that private company valuations are interim markers and the curve shifted with high valuations early with series Bs and Cs, but the end goal is the same. Though you saw 50 to 100x valuations on businesses with 10 to 20 million in revenue, minting a bunch of unicorns the last couple of years, the end state as a sustainable public company is the same as the previous cohort. Get to 200 million to a billion dollars in revenue, improve gross margins from 40, 50% to 75, 80%, Scale down sales and marketing from 60 to 70% of revenues to 25, 30% at scale. R&D from 40 to 50% to 15% at scale. And really generate 25% operating margins as you get to 500 million to a billion dollars in revenue. That will help you create a five or $10 billion company in any market. And the good news is that the last couple of years allowed you to raise a lot more cash than you would have otherwise. Growing 50 to 60% consistently with margins improving every year will be valued much more than 80 to 100% growth burning all your cash in 12 to 18 months. Now, it's time to use that cash wisely and think about efficiency early in your growth cycle. Let's talk about some best practices on how we can accomplish efficient growth. First and foremost, the biggest contributor to efficient customer acquisition is good product design, which engages your target user or champion early in the cycle. No startup conversation goes by without referencing product-led growth or PLG in the first five minutes these days. But let's recognize that it cannot be a one-size-fits-all strategy. For companies like Postman or Atlassian or Sneak, where the user, the developer, is also the buyer, you can engage them through a product and lead them to a self-serve purchase in days or weeks to drive lands 
before sales steps in to drive large deals. However, there are many other successful examples of product-assisted growth. For instance, Snowflake or Databricks or GitLab, where the engaged user leads you to the economic buyer, the head of data or the VP of engineering or the CTO, who then helps drive the land deal using an inside sales motion. Even traditional sales influence growth motions, where you have a complex multi-party negotiation leading to a six or seven figure deal with enterprises can be accelerated with a product trial instead of a long proof of concept. There are different paths to success, but it starts with recognizing which flavor of product assistance fits your target market. What I'm referencing here, by the way, is key to landing deals efficiently in the first $100 million revenue journey. Beyond that, you do need enterprise motions to turbocharge large deals, even for product-led companies to scale beyond 100 million. Now, the rise of product-led and product-assisted growth complicates the demand funnel, but it also generates a much broader aperture of interest. Historically, you'd see early interest in the form of webinars, white paper downloads, quote requests, which your SDR or sales development rep would qualify as a sales qualified lead before an account executive works on it. That cycle usually takes a few months for enterprises and could be expensive for smaller SMB deals. Now, you see complex two-way interactions that can help you qualify intent early in the cycle. You can see users play with their open source product and ask questions in your Slack or Discord channel. You can see them in your freemium product, playing with dummy data or connecting their AWS accounts. All of these touch points need to be qualified by different channels and if you can streamline product qualified or marketing qualified leads efficiently, you can drive higher conversion and faster deal velocity. Specifically, we have benchmarked a number of different conversion funnels across our portfolio and other companies we know well to compare and contrast historic conversion rates with product assisted conversion rates. First and foremost, there are differing nomenclatures we need to standardize. Signups, activated users, weekly active, daily active, all this terminology needs to be aligned with your classic MQL, SQL, SAL terminology. Secondly, we have seen signups to product qualified leads or activated users convert at 15 to 20% versus 8 to 10% early in the demand cycle, mid funnel, conversion from a qualified to an actionable sales opportunity with a product motion is also slightly higher. And ultimately, the overall conversion rate at three to 6% is twice to thrice as high as traditional conversion funnels. Also with POCs replaced with product trials and higher engagement early, you end up with a 30 to 50% faster sales cycle end to end, even for enterprises. In many cases, both of these channels, product and marketing assisted can combine together and help you get the best of both worlds. Engage large customers with a faster sales cycle and SMB customers with a more efficient product-driven sales motion. Finding leads through the most efficient channel is only part of the equation though. The other part is aligning it with the right product marketing and sales playbook. For global 10,000 customers who are interested, even if there's a cloud trial ongoing, it makes sense for a sales-led motion where you engage procurement and have a business value assessment with various economic buyers while your sales engineer is handling the product trial with the right users. It may start with a pay-as-you-go or pay-g consumption model or an annual contract, but either ways, with the right sales engagement, it will invariably end up as a multi-year committed deal within months of engagement from what we have found. Finding the right workload and lowest friction method along with buyer engagement is much more important than landing the largest deal upfront. Now, you contrast that with a mid-market customer, you want to lead with the product and get them to a paywall to land a small deal, then get inside sales involved to get a fifty dollars to $100,000 deal to balance efficiency with the cost of sales. And for SMB customers, for a certain class of products, you can stay with the sell serve motion all the way, leading to small lands through a cloud marketplace. They can stay there for most SMB companies or you can get sales involved later in the cycle if the existing customers grow in size. Aligning the sales playbook with customer type is only one part of the equation. You also need to follow through with a sales comp plan that is aligned with your go-to-market strategy. We have seen SaaS comp plans updated to a million to target 
and a faster six to nine month ramp, quarterly targets, and a net new ARR to account for churn. This has resulted in LTV to CAC of two to three X, which is healthy. There are a new class of compensation plans with product assisted motions targeting enterprises where landing a large logo, even with a small deal, and then driving massive 150% plus NDR or net dollar retention with a consumption model is more important. Here, the comp plans are focused on logos, often monthly with large customers and reward finding the logo almost regardless of deal size or whether it's annual commit or pagey. This is a work in progress and has demonstrated 150% plus growth at a billion dollar scale at some of the best companies we know with an LTV to CAC of 5X plus. We expect to have many more insights on specific comp plans here for next year's report and happy to talk offline if any of you are interested. Now, the reason this comp plan works well is because landing a large logo with low friction and getting them to use the product with a natural expansion with more usage and add-on products leads to a 10x plus top line expansion. For example, Datadog and Confluent have 10 to 20% of the logos drive 80% of revenue and Cloudflare has a staggering 1%, drive 60% of revenue. So discovering these leads and aligning the right product marketing and sales playbook for these customers is key. Global 10,000 customers with more than a billion dollars in revenue make up a large chunk of the $900 billion in infrastructure spend. And now we have a more effective way to land and expand them rather than the traditional 12 to 18 month sales cycle. What you see here, it's a multi-year view of expansion within quality customers and why customer success is critical. Landing a large logo and growing them 130% can help you triple the revenue over a 10-year period versus 110% NDR. It really adds up. This is why driving higher usage and cross-selling add-on products with your customer success team is key to long-term growth. Also, it should be no surprise that most of the companies growing 50% at scale and with good efficiency have 130% net dollar retention as upselling is so much more cost effective at the margin. The third dimension to efficient growth beyond land deal size and net dollar expansion is the pricing unit. Aligning pricing per unit with perceived value is key to landing faster deals and frankly, managing the churn in trying times as well as potentially increasing price in this inflationary environment. For instance, Snowflake is perceived to drive more business insights and pricing it based on the amount of data analyzed has a clear ROI on the business value it drives. CrowdStrike, on the other hand, protects your endpoints and the more endpoints you pay for with different layers of protection, there's a clear ROI on the dollar spent on it. The less you spend on human capital and the more you spend on software to make up for it, the more flexibility there is to adjust or increase the price per unit as long as the ROI is clear. And finally, as you focus on growing efficiently across your customer base, the counterbalancing act is also managing your own expenses internally. We've seen stock-based compensation really increase this year versus last year as more options are handed out to make up for high strike prices last year or to drive more retention. Even though it's a non-cash expense, it really adds up in the mid to long run as it increases your share count significantly. Now, there's no one silver bullet here, but some companies have moved to RSUs, which is restricted stock units early in the cycle, and other founders have looked into lowering the 409A valuations proactively to have a larger spread in option value to manage your stock-based compensation expenses. Hopefully, you apply some or many of these best practices to help you scale your business efficiently, leading up to an IPO when the market does open up next. When you do, the following slides talk about a few metrics that are key to getting and staying at the right valuation post-IPO. While the puck keeps going back and forth, history will show that revenue growth and efficiency measured by the rule of 40 are the two biggest drivers of valuation over the years. In aggregate, Revenue growth still matters slightly more to a higher valuation than efficiency. However, as we showed in a slide earlier, for high growth companies with more than 30% growth, efficiency actually correlates more to valuation multiple. Basically, high growth is now seen as 50% plus with a quicker path to profitability than 70 to 100% growth while burning a ton of money. The latter is getting punished in this market 
and will as long as interest rates stay high. Looking at multiples alone is only part of the picture. A growth adjusted multiple, as in enterprise value over revenue, divided by growth rate, normalizes it for growth, and we're now back to the long-term average of 0.3 to 0.35x. Rule of 40 is a key driver for efficiency and one you want to really keep your eyes on. As shown earlier, it's either the number one or number two driver of valuation multiples and something you have to pay close attention to as your revenue matures. As you think about benchmarking your metrics to other IPO candidates from the last cohort, it may help you to see where you rank relative to these companies. Cloud infrastructure companies continue to be indexed to strong trends as the mega vendors, AWS, Azure, GCP, at 10 to $50 billion in revenue are still growing by 30, 40%. With that in mind, the latest cohort of IPOs has enjoyed strong growth with most names above 45 to 50%, and that's the expected bar for a strong IPO in these markets. Secondly, as you think about efficiency early on, the product-led or assisted motions we discussed earlier can help you acquire customers efficiently as measured by your sales magic number. Also by leveraging consumption models and the right comp plans to encourage your sales team to land quality logos, you can build best in class net dollar retention above 130%, which is key to sustain 50% growth over time. Ultimately, efficient customer acquisition and driving expansion with quality logos translates to a high lifetime value to customer acquisition cost, which is LTV to CAC. And that's a direct driver of efficient growth and something you should keep top of mind along the way. Now we're going to switch gears to themes we find interesting at Battery for investments in this market. Historically, we have seen a lot of activity on the front end of the development stack. From React and Angular to headless CMS and mobile app development, we're now seeing a lot of activity in the back end as a service space, abstracting databases, authorization logic, and other middleware services allowing front end developers to transform as full stack developers. This will also enable faster development velocity by simplifying the complex mesh of backend services and making it consumable as a set of APIs. Second, machine learning has been exploding, but a lot of activity has been offline and analytical. For instance, historically companies would create a risk or fraud model with offline training data and then use it to analyze bad actors or personalize search results. We're now seeing more training activity move online where live results are used in real time to fine tune models and we can use it for operational use cases, not just offline analytics. The bigger move though in the space is from predictive AI to generative AI, where advances in new general purpose models like GPT-3 or DALI for computer vision have allowed us to generate output as opposed to just augmenting human activity with AI. I expect a gold rush of companies creating natural language outputs for marketing, sales, customer outreach, to more complex activities like writing code for you and even generating audio and video outputs. It's hard to fathom how far this could go, but it's a very exciting area that we continue to monitor. Any new macro trend is incomplete without security to keep things in check. As development frameworks and the ease of code generation increase development velocity, especially in the cloud, we see security get closer and closer, not only to developers, but the applications, and the data we generate, but also to the identities that access these applications to keep things airtight end to end. Going forward, as generative AI creates more machine generated content, we'll need to build up a security and compliance stack to keep things in check there as well. More on that next year. And then finally, even though we've seen a compression in the crypto stack, the underlying blockchain enables a class of Web3 DeFi apps that are still very interesting. We're spending time in the developer toolkit to create those applications and security and monitoring of these DeFi apps enabled by Web3. To wrap things up, guys, we still continue to be very excited about the future of cloud infrastructure and open source technologies. There is an amazing amount of private companies that have and continue to do well, even in this environment. While financing deal value and volumes have dropped compared to 2021, largely due to mega unicorn rounds from crossover investors vanishing, it is still a healthy pace compared to the last few years. More interestingly, the last cohort of public companies with open source or cloud infrastructure routes have collectively grown their revenue fivefold, from 3 billion to 16 billion 
and are slated to grow to 25 billion over the next calendar year. On one hand, this is a staggering number, but on the other hand, it is a small fraction of the $900 billion in legacy infrastructure spend just waiting to be disrupted. And to put things in perspective, global infrastructure revenue is slated to grow from $1 trillion to $5 trillion by 2050, as high inflation drives adoption of software and cloud as a deflationary force. I hope you can see why we continue to be so excited about cloud infrastructure. If you can leverage cloud tailwinds and scale your business, but also focus on efficiency and profitability, early in the cycle, there's a tremendous amount of value you can create for you and your employees. Thank you for joining me today. And a thank you to my entire team for all their research leading up to this report. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Any way in which we can be a resource to you, from discussing market trends to operational best practices we're seeing across the industry, we would love to chat.